Hello there, good afternoon, and welcome to Resilient Masterminds, brought to you by the Economic Times and by Microsoft. Thank you all for joining us. Warm welcome and thanks to all the panelists for sparing time and to all the audience members who join us today and listen to us. My name is Alokesh Bhattacharya. I'm senior editor of the Economic Times. I will host today's discussion. This is the second episode of a series of eight power pack brainstorming sessions with C-suite leaders of India Inc. And so you should really keep a watch out for the rest of the series. This is the second one. And today in the second edition, we are going to have two very exciting sessions. The first is a panel discussion with chief operating officers on the subject, building strategic leadership for a hybrid future. And after that, me and my colleague Suchetna Ray, who's the senior assistant editor of ET, we will have a stimulating chat with Arvind Gupta, founder and head of the Digital India Foundation. I'm sure you will enjoy both sessions. So let's start off. Now for the first session, let me start by introducing the panel to you. It's a very strong power pack panel of leaders. We have with us Jairaj Shamugam, COO of Bangalore International Airport. Hello, everyone. We have Rahul Rasal, COO of Future Generally India Insurance Company. We have Ajoy Singh, COO of Fractal Analytics. We have R.S. Sajdeva, COO of Aisha Trucks and Buses. We have Rajiv Sodhi, COO of Microsoft India. We have Monish Darda, co-founder and CTO of Icertis. And we have Manpreet Singh Ahuja, Chief Digital Officer of PwC India. Thank you all gentlemen for finding time and coming to the discussion today. Now, in today's world, you are either a digital company or you are dead. This is a famous saying that uh, we heard about two years ago, much before uh, COVID hit us. So today, after the pandemic has hit, the truth of this statement has hit us very, very hard. Now, to, because this digital uh, effort is so crucial to companies, we would like to start this panel discussion with something on how digital can impact business strategy. And for that, I would like to invite Manpreet of PwC to set the context for today's discussion through an understanding of digital transformations, strategies for enterprises. Manpreet, over to you. Hi, Alok. The, so just uh, setting the context, I don't think we've got to get ready for the hybrid future. The hybrid reality is here. Uh, and, and I think we've got to go past the mindset of you know, we've accommodated well, we've managed the risk and exposure well by being able to work remotely. We've got to convert that into a strategic uh, advantage. Uh, and it's easier said than done. Uh, there is a lot of thinking, a lot of investment, a lot of prioritization that leaders are supposed to do to be able to make this a, a edge over a world that has fundamentally transformed in this uh, last 12 to, uh, you know, 12 odd months. So, uh, you know, and one of the biggest shifts that we've all learned in this period as companies, as 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 clients, you know, because I come from a consulting world, is that the the customer itself has changed. The customer's needs and demands have changed. And the good news is, corporates have responded reasonably fast and rapidly in in addressing to that changed need. So while that's a happy news, and we hear saying you we've done our digital transformation and we're in good shape. But the ground reality is, is this change going to stick? Is this change uh, you know, done well enough to exploit the real benefits of some of the investments that have been done? Or are you a company that's staying in the fringe? Is really where uh, you know, smart companies are spending the time uh, and energy to decipher uh, this issue? So if, if I were to go back, uh, so one of the biggest shifts that have happened in this period is that the customers uh, uh, you know, customers themselves have dramatically moved to online channels and companies have responded. You know, companies have started thinking about an omni-channel experience and they have made the investments to be able to engage with the customer much more effectively uh, in a remote environment. But I don't think that's fully solving and gearing them up for the future. Uh, this is just being at the fringe right now and the companies will have to rewire themselves to really exploit the benefit and the opportunity that's at the table. And, and really what I want to say is a lot of corporate India is wired around employees being the heart of the organization and a company kind of bringing in the values and the cultures and the operating uh, ecosystem that enables the organization to deliver to a customer. 
And as far as we are concerned, we think that this whole model is kind of going upside mm -hmm. down, where companies will have to rewire themselves with the customer being in the center. And actually, the entire employee and the ecosystem, whether it's alliances, whether it's gig workforce, uh, rallying around the customer with the actionable data and insights that Digital Today provides to them to be able to offer insights and create better value. Uh, and, and companies will actually begin to be a, you know, a broader construct, loosely knit, uh, a much wider definition than what it historically used to be because you, know, you will have alliances, you will have uh, cloud relationships, you will have uh, an ecosystem that would have been built together like a set of network nodes that will work together to provide value to relationships uh, that exist within that network. If you have to navigate to that shift where customer gets to the center, you'll have to rewire the organization. You will have to rewire the customer journeys where functional ecosystems will not help. You know, it will largely be cross-functional teams working together to reimagine the customer journeys. And then you will have to bring in the power of digital. You will have to bring in the power of data. You will have to bring in the power of intelligent automation to be able to provide a seamless environment to customers. Uh, and, and that is where the COOs of today will be facing the challenge of how to prioritize and how to make the right investments in enabling the shift to stay. Uh, while customer is the most important piece, uh, it just also is equally important that the uh, employee environment also has the right data and the right actionable insights to be able to thrive in this environment. Uh, and, and the famous uh, thought that comes to the mind is, I don't think anybody has seen us more closely over the last 365 days as maybe a Microsoft Teams has. What will it take for us to imagine the actionable insights that it can throw back to an employee uh, you know, keeping all the privacy and confidentialities in mind for the employee to operate much better uh, uh, and, and, and deliver to a customer much better. And that will be the workplace of the future that we've got to get ready with. Just the last point I want to make is the whole modularity that we will have to start bringing into the organization because, uh, you know, whether it is scaling at a very fast pace or gearing up for reconfiguring ourselves for Dealing with crisis, you know, crisis management and resilience weren't necessarily as much a top of agenda, you know, till about 12 months back. But you know, today with with leveraging the gig ecosystem, the cloud ecosystem, uh, you know, there is a certain modularity that businesses can bring to the table, that digital can bring to the table, that can help us scale up or reconfigure uh, to deal with a a crisis or a situation, and uh, and and be able to do a hyper customization of the business and the offerings to customers. So this is the changed world, and it is like being on a treadmill to exploit the opportunity, leveraging all the data that is available around us uh, to make a sustained difference to the marketplace. Thank you. Thanks, Manpreet. That's a lot of very, very interesting things. You know, what I really was uh, thinking about when you were presenting this is uh, how do you do this modular kind of approach, uh, you know, for cross-functional teams? We are actually saying that let there be no hard and fast uh, distinctions of functions, right? Instead, take projects and bring cross-functional teams into customer-centric projects. Is that what you're saying? Is that possible yeah. to do across uh, multi-office and multinational corporations like, say, Microsoft? I, you know, if I were to go first, Alokda, and, uh, you know, for everyone here on the panel, I just think there is a reality and it's no more a choice. You know, there were times when we were geared up with functions that were responsible for an aspect of the business. You know, I'm a business planning function that would look at some historical data, make a strategy and let the business run for a year and then I will revisit it at the end of a quarter or at the end of the year. Gone are those days. You have to be closer to the customer and you have to be gathering data at every stage of that journey. So, I mean, if I were a cola, be, to be a cola company and let's say if I serve a billion drinks to a customer, how is it that I can be configured in a way such that I gather insight from each transaction and, are, and, I, and then I'm able to bring a better product or a better experience to my customer is how we'll have to reconfigure ourselves to. And the only way you can do that is by you know, operating in a virtual environment where you have V teams coming together uh, with multiple capabilities delivering to a particular agenda and a project. Since I took Microsoft's name, let Rajiv come in on that. What's your view on this? Yeah, no, I was about to come in, Anuk, and, and let me add to Manpreet. I, I think it is absolutely the right thing. He set the stage, basically, right? You'll have to rewire your firm. You'll have to do that on the back of technology. 
And uh, what you said, right? Can this be modularized? Can this work in a multifunctional uh, sort of an environment? We call this the digital feedback, right? Today, you live in a world where data gets integrated and comes from all aspects, right? You get data from your customers, you get data from your employees, you get data from your products, uh, the instrumentation that you have, and you get data from your operations. Um, I think how you pick up that data, how you bring it all together, uh, run the analytics on it, run machine learning and AI on it, and then create that into insights, which you can then inform back, right? Because getting the insight is of no use if you cannot take action on that insight. And that to me is the digital feedback loop, right? Collecting data and signal from the market and from the various operations of your business. Um, uh, you know, running insight and completing the insight out of it and then informing your operation back. And in fact, Alok, I would like to point out that, you know, we've started to look at true digital companies or true companies that are leveraging the power of data and AI are companies that use signal from one department to actually inform the action of another department. That creates a fully digital enterprise to us. You know, and a good example here is, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, for example, Mintra, what they have done is use the power of data. Uh, as, as COVID hit us, um, as, uh, you know, world shifted to online e-commerce, uh, they used over half a million to a million customers and the signals coming from that to actually inform suppliers saying what products are in demand, what should you stop, what should you sell, uh, and actually use that power to make Mintra much, much more uh, resilient and agile to customer needs. So that's an example of data being used, uh, you know, to create this digital enterprise that Manpreet spoke about. Recording, we're discussing about, hey, is the lock lockdown going to come back? You know, yes, if, if we know that's going to happen, and if there is a chance at least, then maybe we can plan for this better to take advantage of that fact, right? And <laughs> it's kind of, it's a, it's a weird thought. But here's where the, you know, in my mind, the, the change happens with the chief operating officer for the last year, it's been a chief ouch officer. You wake up, you say, hey, I want to go, you know, go, go remote, take 5,000 people remote uh, in, in less than a week. And then, you know, I have this logistics problem. I have to deliver laptops, I have to deliver vaccines, I have to deliver, you know, manage my logistics, cold chain, all the problems we have all been facing. It's, it's been ouch after ouch after ouch. So now you have to kind of, in, you know, and, and I think uh, Manpreet also set up that context very well. You have to think about, you know, how data analytics, cloud, the digital side of things, which are virtual, which don't need a physical presence and a physical avatar in the real world. How do you leverage that to the fullest? Sorry. I'll take, yeah. it, take it to the next level. Um, exactly one year ago when COVID hit us, Fractal was called into a service by municipal corporation to make sense of what's happening. You re remember the situation a year ago, we were not aware of how the disease is progressing. We were not aware of what are the hotspots, how many beds are available. And we were called in to make sense of all of this data, get data from multiple hospitals, understand the international traffic which is coming in, understand which beds are empty, where are the pockets of hotspot. Now in a non-digital world, imagine doing this, getting so much data, making sense of it, and taking it back for action, would have taken multiple weeks. But we partnered with uh, cloud partners, a uh, lot of team take, came together, and imagine, we did it in three days. In three days, we were able to use hyper agile ways of getting all of this together, giving the insights back to the municipal corporation so that they can save lives, they can manage hospital capacities, and they can make sure that uh, restrictions are placed where it's required, and then move forward. So I think in this world, working in a hyper agile way has become possible exactly because of technologies which uh, are coming in, whether it's cloud, digital, AI, all those kind of things. And I think time is no longer a luxury. Those days of you know mapping your digital journey over two to three years period, those are gone. It has to be done in a matter of weeks or months, if not hours. Jairaj had come in before you, Rahul, so I'll just uh, ask him yeah, to absolutely. finish first. Uh, yeah. Because I'd like, really like to know the airport view because you're also heavily regulated. I mean, apart from the other, you know, restrictions and everything, air, airports is a very, very difficult business to be in, right. uh, even in normal times, right? So what has this done to your operational, you know, flexibility and agility and what are the things that have changed? No, Alakesh, uh, thanks for, for that. Um, the airport and the aviation industry has always been at the forefront of technology, it's always been technology driven. And in fact, like they say, every crisis presents an opportunity. 
what happened for during the <clears throat> the um, crisis itself, during the COVID crisis, is that the Ministry of Civil Aviation told us that guys, uh, if you want to reopen operations safely, uh, please ensure contactless travel. And that gave us an opportunity to how to remove all the um, stamping of boarding passes. Remember stamping of boarding passes? When they used to stamp your boarding or they check your boarding passes 100 times before you finally reach the gate, all that is yeah. gone. Gets, so from the time yep. a passenger enters the terminal right up to the gate, uh, it's purely contactless. You just scan your boarding pass and you just pass through the various uh, checkpoints. That technology was always there, but we always uh, got resistance from various stakeholders because they said, look, you must stamp the boarding pass. You must check the boarding pass. You physically must uh, hold the document to check. But um, because of this um, crisis, we are able to push through some of this technology um, agenda across. And in fact, B Bangalore Airport was the first airport in the world to have a few fully contactless travel from um, gate, uh, sorry, from the entry to the terminal right up to the gate. And Riding on that, we introduced more um, contactless um, facilities like um, you can order your food on the app and the food is delivered to your uh, seat at the uh, terminal itself. You don't have to join the queue to buy your food. We also introduced a virtual help desk. Previously, you have to, used to have these uh, counters where a staff will be sitting there and every passenger goes up to ask questions. Now we made that completely virtual. You just put a screen there and there's a staff sitting somewhere centrally uh, answering questions. So people have got used to these uh, virtual um, platforms. They've got used to technology, and we are riding on it to see how best we can push the the envelope even much further. Right. You're right; it yeah. is highly regulated. But because of the crisis, I think even the regulators are looking at the benefit of using technology to make travel seamless. Yeah, but Jera, just just bringing in a perspective there. I mean, the amount of data that you know, hopefully an airport generates and the possibility of making travel a great experience. You know, not every travel is the same. A corporate travel is different from, you know, a family traveling to somebody who's spending a bomb to make an experience. I mean, I still feel there's this massive opportunity of exploiting that data and giving that giving that predictive insight or an experience such that there's an intimate relationship of a you know customer traveling into the airport. That's Absolutely. still an opportunity. And somebody who travels used to travel three times a week uh, I'd love to see that happen. Absolutely, um, Manpreet. But the perennial problem always has been who owns the customer data, right? When the customer enters the airport, yeah. uh, he's actually the yeah. airline's customer. Uh, as an airport, how do we use that data? How can we share that data with the airlines in order to uh, provide a seamless service? And that's what we are working on. We introduced um, what they call the Zovis queue management system in August last year, where we can track a particular passenger from the time they enter the uh, terminal right up to the gate to see how many minutes they spend at each um, checkpoint. And we're using that data to see uh, how best to manage resources, uh, how best to tell um, in real time to tell airlines to please, you have to open up your counters because the number of passengers in the queue is exceeding 10 minutes, for example. So we are working with the airlines, but you're absolutely right. When I was in the airline, was, when I was on the other side, and now I'm in the airport, of course, but previously when I was the airline, there's absolutely what we wanted to do. There's so yeah. much in, tons of data. It, it's, yeah. it's an interesting perspective that as an airline, you sometimes mm -hmm. wonder there'll be better valuation and, and, and business returns if you could just use that data and exploit that for a certain insight or benefit. I'm wondering if you've been allowed to keep that data for very long, Jairaj. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, of course, you're covered by the privacy uh, laws, yeah, data yeah. privacy laws. That's the thing. Rahul, because insurance and auto, both of these, uh, especially trucks and buses, the commercial vehicles part, right? They have huge indicators of uh, economic movement and all. And insurance companies uh, during this lockdown and all, I, your business models were turned completely upside down. Tell us how that impacts your right. operations. I first just want to set a little bit of context of our thought process. You know, today all of us are talking about resilience, recovery, a never before crisis. And I ask myself, is it our birthright to be unprepared for COVID just because this is our first time COVID is happening. So there's going to be a no way to show it, you know, happening every year. COVID is just a root cause. The impact of COVID is something that you should actually be stress testing on your business model. Now, I come from the insurance industry and I come from the life insurance industry. We've always presented ourselves as extremely face-to-face, -face, advisory driven, Unless I meet the customer, touch and feel and build trust, there is no opportunity for sale. Now, this is a fundamental building block that should be tested in any kind of a stress test where you say there is something happening to your business model. COVID is just an excuse, the way I look at it. 
So it's quite unfair that we should allow ourselves the leeway of being unprepared for this. On a second step, people have been talking about digital since times immemorial. At least this century, everybody speaks about it. Yeah. And a lot of people have been moving digital even in the insurance industry. Every insurer is a digital year. 90% happens face to face till COVID hit us. What happened actually is that the front ending of the entire business model turned more and more digital. But the way you underwrite customers, the way you process an application, the way you provide a customer experience remained completely manual in nature. So even if I provide a great tab to my sales employees and they can go and meet a customer, what COVID did was that now you have the tab, you have all the equipment, but you can't be face to face. So the whole mindset that I have all the information with me, but I'm going to do what we are doing today. This seminar one year ago have happened with all of us sitting in a particular room and talking to each other, never like this. So that mindset itself was not changed. So I have all the equipment, but I don't have the ability or the mindset to actually be remote and complete the same process. And which is why this whole modularity of how we interact with each other. Now, the employees have to be able to interact with technology and together interact with the prospect. I think that is a big jolt for the entire insurance industry. So how do you train the mindset? How do you retrain the mindset of your employees? I think that's where the business model struggled and which is why I keep asking myself, should we have not been prepared for this eventuality? where I cannot meet my prospect and yet need to complete my business model? It's a very good question you ask, Rahul, because uh, there are companies who are more than 100 years old when the last pandemic hit us, and I don't think we have learned much from that experience. So uh, we'll let that part be. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Did I interrupt you? No, not at all. So basically, what this has done is that the whole digital mindset has now allowed us to carry forward. And as a chief operating officer, the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, operational risk. Now, everybody talks about operational risk, but if I look at it technically, it was only in 1999 that the Basel Committee on, you know, uh, banking supervision actually published the papers on this between 1999 and 2001. And they basically said that they, eval you know, elevated this to an independent, which is a distinct and controllable risk requiring its own tools and organization. So, you have a pandemic, we are all moving digital. Operational risk is at the core of any financial institution, yet operational risk is a very nascent field. We are yet trying to understand the interconnectivities. With the advent of digital and with the advent of analytics, I think the ability to forecast operational risk is sort of changing. And I think that's one piece which all financial institutions and more so you know, people who predict the future like insurance, are sort of grappling with right now. I mean, that's that's the biggest difference that I see. The focus, the Tina factor saying that now there is no longer an alternative. I have to rely on predictive rather than extrapolatory uh, attitudes towards business. I think that is another aspect that is preparing us for the hybrid present or present reality or the hybrid future. That, that's the that's the yeah. big difference I see. I can yeah. just add to what Rahul just said, you know, highlighting that that mindset that he was talking about. You know, we did a study with, uh, you know, along with IDC to all our customers. And it clearly showed that one, everybody considered innovation to be an imperative and that's okay, that's fine. That was there earlier also. But I think what was what was heartening to see that over 65, 70% of the organization said that post COVID, innovating and driving the innovation agenda within an enterprise, within their companies had become far easier. Because the pandemic had sort of created that Tina, uh, you know, the new, the no alternative, or created the imperative uh, to do that. And I just wanted to highlight that how real this mindset is. Because we saw that across with governments, we saw that with some of the regulated industries, we saw that in healthcare, we saw that in education. It is across all pervasive, I would say. And and I think that is one of the trends that is here to stay. Uh, you know, COVID or no COVID, even when the world comes to normal. We will see this shift uh, taking a full, uh, you know, getting even more of momentum than where we are right now. Rajinder, you know, uh, I remember April of 2020 when there were zero deliveries of uh, passenger cars. That was uh, a nightmare to everybody, right? Uh, I don't remember the commercial vehicle numbers, but I don't suppose they would be much better at that time because of the lockdown. The very thought of risk 
really hit must have hit you very very hard you know in that month and the ensuing months so how how has this pandemic uh, you know uh, changed your uh, views towards operational agility flexibility and and through technology and after you all come to oh, i i thanks i have heard uh, from all the speakers uh, i can say vcv is a uh, joint venture with volvo uh, iShares joint venture with volvo and we manufacture a commercial vehicle and uh, everything has come to standstill. We have been working on the digitalization before that, five, six years before that. We started both on the customer interface, supply chain management, as well as manufacturing interface and R&D interconnectivity. All those areas we have been working on the digitalization, but it was India before 1991, when everybody talked about liberal liberalization, but nobody actually did when it crisis came. So paradigm, the inflection point came the COVID that all the tools which you had developed definitely were used. And if I look at uh, VC, we are a typical commercial, com uh, typical manufacturing company. If you see that one bracket, one basket is the customer interface and R&D. Second interface is supply chain and third is the sales. In all the three areas, we, we saw that digitalization, as many have put across the TINA factor, that now we look at and say that, how did we collaborate? In R&D, the major thing is how do you need to collaborate, getting the feedback from your downstream function and incorporating the product and develop a product. When almost four, four months, five months, people were operating from home and no chance of having the physical meeting, then the digital phase came into an IDM, like we have got integ integrated data management digitalization platform is there with us. That helped us to connect all the people and still we could talk with each other, give feedback, review the technicality and go for the new product introduction. That was one thing. And if I look at how our sales team are connected with the customer, same, you are generating the inquiry, but mindset was unless either like uh, Rahul said that unless you sit in front of customer, you can't sell the truck. This was a paradigm, but our digitalization team came out with the, the uh, digital model of the vehicle. And when we presented to the customer, an initial our hit rate was one in 100. And after four months, our hit rate has improved to around 10 in 100. 100 interaction and you are generating almost 100 inquiries into the firm orders. So 1 to 100 to 10 to 100, that was the improvement over four months. And that happened because we could take that digital uh, model of the vehicle specification and demonstrate actually how the vehicle performed. That were helped. And third thing, when I look at uh, supply chain and manufacturing, now this is a very difficult area. In April, we produce zero truck. In May, we produce 400. And this month, we'll produce 7,000 trucks. That's the ramp up. You can see that. And today, we are not able to meet the demand. I can say I'm falling short. Even after producing 7,000, I'm falling short by 25%. But how it is happening? It is even today, COVID in MP, where indoor also we see that number of cases are going up, but people are working on assembly line. Physical people are working on my line, my supervisor, everybody is there on the line. Of course, all the COVID precautions they're taking, but how the digital thing is helping. s and open process, all the customer inquiry from the dealers are getting consolidated in our Udan platform, which is a digital platform. There, all the inquiries get converted into the firm order, which come to us. Through IDM, the data from R&D goes to manufacturing. And through the ESAP system, we are ensuring that all the uh, models, the data is generated, which is the product data is generated. Parts are being procured. Call-up system is being implemented for the suppliers also. So all the interfaces of the organization, we are able to use the digital. That's why we are today surviving as an organization. Had that digital platforms, either in the customer interface, on the supply chain interface, and the R&D interface would not have been there, this organization would have been st standstill, I can say very clearly. And this has opened a new paradigm shift in the organization, and uh, really we see that uh, today we are able to connect to the customer. And I, one thing more I want to say that we, we had a, always we wish to meet the customer. I think again, I'm going to Rahul what you are saying that you are able to convert. We were looking at the data that how many customers we have met on the digital platform and how many have placed the order. 85% customer have placed the order. After meeting them on the digital platform, understanding their product or understanding their problem from the past thing or going for the repeat order and convert that into all that we are able to convert that into 85% order we are able to convert. I think this is becoming a way of life if I look at that and uh, engaging supplies, engaging uh, uh, customer, engaging our supply chain, manufacturing suppliers, all stakeholders and dealers. 
this is what has helped us to remain. And today, as I said, that supply is out, uh, demand is outpacing the uh, what we can supply today. That's where we stand today. And uh, there, I see that one downside is that uh, when we plan the meetings or interaction, it is end to end. Four o'clock, one meeting finish. Four o'clock, second meeting starts. That is putting a lot of pressure on people. And uh, Ajay, you had a point to make. Uh, you want? To I make? have a couple of points. So uh, Rahul said that you know everyone had been talking about digital for many years, and pretty much nothing was happening. And Rahul, I believe uh, a lot of digital makeup was happening. People were, you know, just working on digital on the fringes, and uh, so that was one thing that was happening. In this age, we have to actually change the core of the business using digital and not just tweak digital. And I think other thing coming from AI um, uh, industry, I would like to say that. AI is very effective, but it alone is not sufficient. I think we are not using the power of design thinking, behavioral sciences, you know, solid cloud-based engineering to create the magic out of AI. And in any digital strategy, unless all these multidisciplinary thought processes come together, we will not be able to make a magic. Ajay, interesting point yeah. that you raise. If I may yeah. just add one thing. When we speak about interconnectivity, and we worked in silos. Today, HR is a function. HR manages people, HR manages talent. What is AI? Is AI a resource? Is AI a talent? I think this interconnectivity between managing talent as two subsections of human beings and artificial intelligence is preparing for the future because it's a fact. Today, a lot of the pushback in terms of enf not enforcing, but uh, implementing some of these strategies is because people feel mindset again that redundancy is going to be impinged upon them should we have you know Absolutely. artificial intelligence in underwriting yeah. so okay yeah. this is something which is preparing for the future. how do you how do you manage these two resources for the future to prepare for that hybrid interconnectivity it's human and AI, AI. not human or ai yeah monish your view on this because you know we tend to hear all these technology terms ai ml in isolation but the fact is other is the technology more important or is the design more important you know, I think Ajay said it well. It's you have to have humans and machines work together. I think that's the future. Uh, you know, there's a very um, you know great author that I follow, Isaac Asimov, and he looked at the future and he you know science fiction really, and he said, hey, this is the merging of humans and robots is what humanity is all about. And if you can see it around yourselves, I think the decisions that you take today, we don't know how much we are influenced by the technology around us. And one of the important things here in my mind, we do contract lifecycle management, right? So contract is the center of the universe for us. We are seeing more and more people and more and more companies coming back and saying, hey, this is getting out of hand. The risk and the compliance needs that we need to go in the real world and what people do on the ground in large companies is now you know is getting further and further along and hard to control can you actually take that contract and push it near the transaction so what we are seeing from an ai perspective is really ai not as artificial intelligence but really cognitive intelligence can you figure out what is happening and then give enough information to the person the human who can influence that outcome I, I think, uh, look, AI uh, uh, is is quite fundamental. I mean, I think Ajay said it best. It's not just AI or humans. It's it's you know the how the two come together, uh, and and also I think it's not about uh, you know AI being the solution to every problem. AI needs a lot of building blocks to come in place, uh, you know, before it can actually happen. And I you know we do when we do this work. I mean, there is just a lot of these buzzwords. Uh, that are there in, uh, you know, as we work with customers. But I think it's a fundamental design of, okay, how do you want to reimagine your business? How do you want to reimagine your operations? How do you want to reimagine your product maybe, uh, right? And then use AI and data and all these concepts to actually make that outcome happen. You know, I do want to share, you know, maybe taking a 30 seconds on, on you know, the work, uh, let's say that we did with one of our customers, you know, Larson and Tubro. And if you look at it, it's a vast uh, enterprise. Everybody knows that. They, as you can imagine, they have multiple applications, <clears throat> you know, starting from their SAP system to their IT system to their payroll system to all the line of business applications. So you can imagine they were doing digital for a lot of time, right? But what they did during the pandemic was they created a bot. Uh, right now, the bot was created using AI. 
right? And the bot was actually picking up data from all these different systems and bringing it together into one uh, interface, you can say, which is the bot over here. And the best part is they integrated the bot with Teams because Teams is something that every employee of there was using day to day to connect, right? Now you don't have to go to any other application. You don't have to train the employees into six different applications. You can simply say, hey, you are in Teams, you have a query, you want to raise a ticket, you want to find a resource, just go there, just talk to the bot, and the bot obviously uses AI and cognitive to get the response back to the employees. Now, I think this is a fantastic example which says how do humans and AI work together? How AI is not just one, I mean, it's, it's not the solution to every problem, but actually rides on all the IT investments you've made. And again, you know, back to my original point, this is something which is here to stay. This is a fundamental reimagination, right? It's not going to go back once they come back to the normal from COVID. So I think I think that's an example I thought I'd share with the panel. Manpreet, do you see this? Uh, what do you see? You know, you're, you're also consulting, uh, you know, companies all the time, giving them advice on how to do things. Is there greater focus on the tools, on the technologies? Should I use AI or is there greater greater focus in India in currently on driving the design and thinking through the strategy first and then going for the technology. What do you, you see know, just, on the ground? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just building on that conversation and the question itself, Alokesh, uh, I think one thing where I see a big opportunity is, and this is where AI and humans come together, is this need for, uh, you know, upskilling the workforce. So, you know, there was a culture maybe a few years back where, you know, I would call it the hippo culture where the highest paid employee would take the decisions in the organization, right? You know, you have the CTOs and CDOs and CEOs or the innovation officers taking those innovative calls. I mean, those days are gone. We will have to get to a world where citizen-led innovation becomes a life, where micro assets, micro innovations uh, can be brought to life. And that is where data will be leveraged. That is where AI will be leveraged. That is where intelligent automation will be leveraged. And that is where a quantum leap will happen, uh, where large companies will move. And that's an opportunity that uh, I still think needs to be worked upon. And as more and more of that begins to happen, automatically AI and humans will be here to stay. Uh, right now, I don't think that's happening at scale. And, and forward-looking companies are beginning to invest on, on that agenda. Yeah, but it's a transition that will take its own time, I guess. Uh, you know, one of the things that we, uh, Jairaj, you wanted to come in on? Yes, 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 Alakesh, uh, yes. very interesting conversation. Um, in the aviation industry and airline industry, um, yes, we're very technology driven. We use a lot of data. We, um, we use a lot of uh, technology um, tools to enhance services. But I still feel personally that you cannot replace the human touch. So how do you still deliver the kind of service uh, that is for speed of uh, seamless travel, uh, making it simple to move around the airport or make a booking, but at the end of the day, um, you will never replace the warmth and friendliness of a human uh, person helping you at the um, terminal itself or on the aircraft or when you are in trouble. So how do you balance um, the drive to provide uh, technology, using technology to drive service and yet get our, our frontline staff to be technologically savvy, yet have the warmth and friendliness to deliver the kind of service that um, really makes a difference. Because at the end of the day, um, with all airlines uh, being equal, what will differentiate between one airline and the other is the quality of the service of the uh, staff itself. So these are some of the things that I, I feel that that makes a difference. You can have all the technology in the world, but the differentiation is the quality of the service of your people on the front line. I, I think, uh, Jairaj, I'd probably differ a little bit. You know, the, the last week there was a very watershed moment in my mind, uh, for this decade at least, where a, a set of images that were tweeted on Twitter for 5,000 days were sold for $69 million. And I always thought, you know, owning a painting is a very personal experience, right? And I, you know, if I had all the money in the world, would I pay 69 million for a JPEG? I, I wasn't sure. But when I looked at it, I thought, you know, the definition of experience, the definition of what humans like and need, the definition of, you know, if you if you look at what Rajinder, the business he is in, in terms of selling commercial vehicles, the autonomous vehicles are going to change completely. You know, how you sell, how you run, how you operate, how you maintain, you know, all of that, how you own, because probably, you know, five years later, Rajinder is going to be leasing vehicles as opposed to buying, selling vehicles, right? So I think that experience is changing completely. And that's where that hybrid future actually comes in, you know, 
technology, digitization, and the human touch has to come in together uh, to make this real. Absolutely, and since you mentioned Rajinder, I was actually going to go to Rajinder only for with my next question because Rajinder, we were talking about you know uh, serving customers, and uh, in this whole group, you serve a completely unique set of customers. You know, fleet operators, individual uh, trucks and uh, bus owners. So that kind of customer is uh, hugely different, and their expectations also uh, are something that we don't are not very clear about. Can you tell us a little bit about you know what's your role and how can the COO act as a catalyst to find new ways to serve customers, you know, especially customers of the kind that you serve. What Here, are you doing? Uh, uh, I think uh, if I look at our experience uh, or maybe anywhere uh, in the fleet owners, customer nature may be different, work may be different, but today what he wants is the service, good service, whichever field he is. And uh, here also nature of service is different, but broadly he wants that his after sale experience has to be very, very good. And this we have realized after 10 years of our uh, uh, lot of struggle that uh, we had a very good product, Volvo uh, pedigree products and all those things. How we can make our mark in India and how we can become a very strong player. And this service, I think, uh, there we found that one thing that how we can connect with the connect all the vehicle. So we went ahead with a 100% connected vehicle first in India. And then we set up a based on the Volvo experience in, in the US uptime center. They have an uptime center, which we set up here in India, in, uh, in M Madhya Pradesh, in our plant, very state of the art uptime center where each and every vehicle is uh, data is available to us. Vehicle, if some failure has happened in the vehicle, some problem has come in. We are able to guide the technician because now today we are living in BS6 technology. It's equivalent to Euro 6 technology, very complex. Lot of electronics is there in the vehicle, almost seven to eight sensor, seven actuator, and very complex after treatment system. It is like a chemical factory you are putting on the vehicle today in BS6, particularly diesel vehicles, commercial vehicle. Each and every vehicle, whatever failure happened, it reaches the dealership. Competency building because these people, you can imagine that our dealership people are not very competent and a lot of churning is also there. From our uptime center, we can, once he switch in the vehicle and in the engine management system, he switch on the dongle, the vehicle, all the data is available to us. We are able to tell him what is the fault, what is the diagnostic and what he need to do that. Thing. That's the number one. That's a reactive way to help and making sure the vehicle is up in very, very short time. Ensuring that 98% of the time vehicle is running on the road, not sitting in the workshop of the total life cycle. And second is the very, very proactive working that we know once we know the data is available to us, we know that what is going to fail after 1000 kilometers. If engine is overheating or there's a emissions are higher or there's a law, lympho mode is getting activated, we know the data. And we are able to talk with the driver and the owner and fleet owner and tell him that this is what your vehicle is going to happen. And you need to approach the uh, dealership, which is 20 kilometer away from your destination. You can go to the dealership, part, it, part is available there, and within half an hour vehicle will be rectified and vehicle will be taken care of that. So five days of vehicle downtime has been brought down to two hours. That's where we are able to make a difference and provide a service. and. Fleet owner, he has got only one thing. His vehicle should be on the road maximum percentage of the time. He should have best in class fuel efficiency and he should have the best turn on time in terms of power and torque. We should be like in GST era today, e-commerce era. Earlier, Mumbai daily trip people used to talk about uh, weeks, the two weeks time between 10 years back. Today, people talk in hours. So ensuring that vehicle has got that power and torque, vehicles remain on the road, how we get connected with the vehicle, provide the support from the uptime center. That's where the future and that's where we are working. And it will go, next stage will be the, how we provide that uh, driver alert system that whenever driver is about to sleep or he's fatigued, we are able to caution his fleet owner, our driver also, mm -hmm. so that he can take him off so that he doesn't meet the accident. So safety, accident, and then moving to the autonomous, that's the next phase. All those areas, I think digital interface, digital way of working, and a lot of support we are getting from Volvo also in this thing. And that's where we are going to make sure that our customers, fleet owners are taken care of to the fullest extent. Yes. Rahul, your view on this. You have so, a completely different set of customers. Of course, they are also your customers, right? To Rajinder's absolutely. customers are also yours. 
traditionally we look at human beings as our customers as a broad mm-hmm. category so everybody needs in charge now there are two impacts of the entire pandemic one is a heightened acceptance of the fact that nobody is immortal and we do need in charge and india being one of the lowest penetrated countries in the world from any metric as far as insurance is concerned so that's a perverse positive impact of the entire pandemic the second piece is that we as an organization at future generally have realized that the future lies in ecosystems and how you plug into an ecosystem the ecosystem should be could be something traditional like a bank or the ecosystem could be something completely different and visionary like what we are doing today with the future retail uh, network now here you have a lot of people walking into big bazaar for example and traditionally you would have approached them and spoken to them but today this is where ai and i don't know to use that you know cliche but this is where analytics and digital plays a very enmeshed role based on the shopping habits of people we are actually able to now customize their requirements or needs in terms of what they would need in terms of an insurance you know simple thing like whether a person takes a carry on bag or brings it with himself is actually a good biaser of what kind of insurance can be actually offered so now this is where the functionality of ai is of, of analytics is coming previously it was all front ended making things look better and easier the customer is now the entire targeting piece how do you search for a precise customer not from your perspective but from the prospects customer uh, perspective how do you align the product to that particular customer this has got fine tuned so you have data your ability to sift data your ability to target the right prospect for the right product but more importantly also decide the fulfillment mechanism is it going to be digital is it going to be physical is it going to be digital i think that is what is the big change that we are seeing in our insurance industry today and that is what is helping us to sort of push so today we can actually decide on the buying patterns we can decide on the visiting patterns we can decide on the various electronic set of person carries that what is the best product that is that can be fitted and again offer this in a manner that is convenient to the customer so i think that is a big change for us secondly it has now allowed us to come away from this purely face to face advisory and move into a remote educatory kind of a sales process where you keep educating the customer so that it becomes more i need this not i was sold this because there's a cliche that insurance is never bought it's sold i think that cliche is now undergoing a metamorphosis great so there we have a question on scaling operations with stability and sustainability and i think esg and sustainability are becoming buzzwords in the corporate world and as coos you also have to look at how your operations are going Uh, in a direction that is also sustainable for the business and for your uh, other stakeholders like including your employee and your customers right so how can the coo really influence this operations and how do you how, tell us uh, tell the audience how you can scale your operations keeping sustainability and stability in mind who wants to go first yeah i'll try and take a shot rakesh uh-huh. uh, 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 i think i don't know how many of you know a lot of buzzword is there around cryptocurrencies and bitcoins and all of this correct and uh, the amount of electricity required to generate this bitcoins mining is about 0.5% of the total world's electricity consumption and if i translate that back to the industry where i am coming from ai we run we write tons of lines of codes which read training with need you know inference and those are if they are not sufficient they can actually create a lot of you know electricity consumption so that's one extreme angle which we are thinking of in terms of how to make ai not only more ethical from a usability point of view but also use the resources use the cloud compute in a efficient manner so that it's a long term sustainable model which we uh, which we can build okay jayraj for a lot of focus on sustainability especially in terms of using resources um renewable resources in fact um 100% of our electricity needs at a terminal is all from renewable resources uh, using wind right so wind power so it, it it is the way of the future that you cannot run a business without considering all these sustainable uh, future 
right? So um, water, we are looking at how to uh, build more ponds to harvest rainwater, the terminal itself. So it's not all about um, just um, flying passengers in and out. How do we keep the airport going? How do we save the environment? How do we protect the environment? So this is always at the forefront of strategy. So we are focusing a lot on sustainability and uh, making sure that we become a responsible airport. And just to sort of add to that, you know, sustainability, is it a means to an end? And, and then I try to look at it today. The cliche is geography is history. So the fact that you had hundreds of people traveling from one place to another, and you try traveling from Churchgate to Bolivia in Bombay, I mean, it's an exercise in futility and threat to life, depending on which mode you actually use. So is that in some way helping us, you know, to sort of do our contribution towards it? And that's, that's one piece that I sort of look at it. But I also look at it in terms of the CXO gathering, as you said, and the X has been the X factor. There was a time of chief marketing officer. There was a time of chief people officer. And today, I think it's genuinely the chief operating officer's sort of era that comes in because it's a cross-cutting initiative across you know various, various initiatives that you're running in the organization. You actually have a bird's eye view to all that. Operational excellence, again, when I talk about simply by ensuring a proper work from home uh, policy. You are actually helping the climate in your own way. Now, it is not, it is easier said than done because work from home doesn't mean you simply ask people to work from home. You need to then give them the right tools. The whole mechanism of appraisal of people is going to undergo a change. You were so used to seeing people. You were so used to their body language. You were so used to their physical presence and contribution. Are we prepared today to sort of do it remotely? So when we talk about the entire sustainability piece, this is one angle that we need to consider. The obvious is taking place today. Everything that was going out in terms of paper, I mean, insurance industry is to generate reams and tons of paper. Future Dandari today has the capability of sending you your policy document, which is a thick document, let me assure you, on WhatsApp. Now the regulatory aspects do have to change because this has to be acceptable. So sustainability cannot be an individual organization's deliverable. The whole ecosystem, the regulator, the compliance aspects, people's acceptability, the ability to trace and mitigate fraud in such cases, how do you handle cyber security? All these are sort of have to come together to build sustainability on a platform. And then that's where I think the chief operating officer is going to play a huge role in terms of the remit. At least that's the way I look at sustainability. I just wanted to kind of extend what Raul said. It's a very important point. You know, the, the supply chain, how do you make sure that the supply chain is ethical, it is sustainable, you know, you're preventing child labor. You know, there's all kinds of stuff here, not just sustainability, uh, where you do better business, right? And for us, you know, we lots of our customers have found that actually making these uh, downstream things uh, sustainable and kind of making sure that they are aligned to corporate policies is very hard. So what they've started doing is actually starting enforcing in it in the contract uh, with a fine if uh, suppliers don't follow it. But then, you know, what we have done and gone, have gone ahead is actually apply the blockchain to make sure that the entire supply chain follows this, not just the first tier supplier, but the second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. And one of the things we've noticed, like automotive manufacturers, making sure that the cobalt mines, where the cobalt is source, is not blood mineral, it's not using child labor, it's not using forced labor, and making sure that the contracts reach there. And that doesn't guarantee compliance, but it does guarantee at least contractual compliance. That's the first step of doing that. And I think that's where, you know, having an open, transparent supply chain, if you go to most companies' uh, home pages on, you know, sourcing, ethical sourcing, and so on, uh, including Microsoft, Starbucks, Pizza Hut, you go anywhere, you'll see that there is a component where they want to find out where the pizza corn came from that makes the pizza, where the coffee beans come from, which get into your cup. And I think that transparency, that data, that kind of also AI, because AI has to make sure that you're actually able to track all of this is getting more and more critical. And that's where I think, you know, we have a chance of building a future where it is sustainable, it's more ethical, and business is doing the right things and not getting carried away with profits and the bottom line.
Yeah, Alok, if I can come in now, you know, I think you asked the question around, you know, how do you scale your operations in a sustainable way? So I would like to, you know, maybe come at it from two things that impact the operation, right? Your people and your technology. Eventually, that's what your operation is all about. And I think if you look at your people first, right, uh, there is an element of sustainability there. Because uh, I think I think Ajay was saying that right, you can't make decisions at top. You've got to push decision making down. So as technology becomes pervasive, as the last mile of your employee chain also uses technology, are we giving them the right tools? Are we skilling them right? Uh, becomes an important consideration, right? Uh, we all saw when uh, work from home was happening that people were getting burnt out. So if you imagine a hybrid working scenario where you've hired a lot of people, you scale your operation. How do you get to know that your people are getting burnt out or not? So, you know, we built this uh, AI into teams, for example, right, uh, which which reduces fatigue, uh, which gives you insight into how you are spending time so that you can, you know, you can have a really good conversation manager to employee to say, hey, look, you are actually spending all this time in so many meetings, take a break, uh, you know, and how do you make that sustainable? Uh, also, getting making it easy for people to work from remote locations. For example, here only we were using virtual backgrounds. We are using noise cancellation, which is inbuilt. We don't realize it. It is technology behind the scenes, trying to make it now very very easy for people to connect from anywhere. Right. So that is one element of I think sustainable. I think the second thing is is the technology you are using, the platform you are using, right? Is that creating it in a way that it is sustainable? Right. So, for example, in, in you know in Microsoft we said. In the next sort of seven to eight years, most certainly by 2030, we'll be carbon negative. Uh, right? In another 20 years, we will remove all the carbon that's ever emitted uh, from Microsoft. Uh, you know, since it was founded, uh, we announced the uh, the innovation fund such that uh, you know we can actually spur innovation around this. The reason why this is important is because when we work with customers, we are able to tell them you are working with a platform which is keeping sustainability in mind. For the reasons we all know, it's very very important. So I think as you think about operations, we've got to approach it from both the people angle and the technology platform angle. And, and I think Monish said it right, you've got to see where it is sourced from, where the value chain is coming from. I think that is one aspect, but also make it sustainable for our people. I think that's how you can, you can really scale it up. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's very easy to scale up and then figure out that it is starting to break at the seams. That's what your CEO doesn't want. Your, your chief operating officer make, wants to make sure it is going to be able to do that. Right. Absolutely. Manpreet, you have the last word. I think it's going to be a hockey stick shift towards, uh, you know, customers, employees and capital chasing companies that have the ESG proposition right. And it's going to happen at a very, very rapid pace. So just when we are breathing easy saying, yeah, we've learned to deal with the customer and we've learned to track the data and we've learned to serve the customer. If we haven't tracked our energy consumptions and the waste we are generating, which trust me, a lot of us may speak, but corporate India is not doing a good job uh, of that right now. Uh, you know, very soon we'll realize we will either be out of capital or customers if we don't get that ESG plot right. Uh, and digital technology, data, I mean, all that we've spoken today with the customer in mind is going to be equally relevant from an ESG perspective. Sooner we start, the better the edge we'll carry. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manpreet. That was, uh, gentlemen, all of you. Thank you so much for the, this hour that you spent with us. It's an absolutely riveting conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. One of those panels that I really enjoyed uh, moderating. Lots and lots and lots of insights. Such a wonderful discussion. You know, we spoke about customers. There was so much emphasis on technology uh, that I was uh, at times uh, perplexed. That is this a CIO discussion or is it a COO discussion, right? Uh, these days, even CEOs uh, tend to talk a lot about digital when we get into discussions with them, which is great because that means that all organizations are looking toward greater productivity, greater efficiencies, and you know, uh, driving greater uh, thing in the long run. So that's fantastic. And uh, thank you all very much. Thank you to the audience for listening in. Remember that we have another session coming up. Uh, stay back for that. And uh, we ha will have now a message from our partner, Microsoft. And then we'll move into the next session with my colleague, Suchetma. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Bye. Great to meet you. That was fun. Lots of learning. Thank you, folks. Quite a phenomenal panel discussion, and we've been having a great event today so far. And uh, now it's time for a very special interaction. Uh, we have with us uh, Arvind Gupta, founder and head of the Digital India Foundation, uh, where he leads digital inclusion, internet governance, cybersecurity, domestic manufacturing, startup India 
and smart cities. Mr. Gupta has over 25 years of experience in leadership, policy and entrepreneurial roles, both in the Silicon Valley as well as in India. He has served as the CEO of MyGov.in and head of BJP's National Technology Department for three consecutive terms. Welcome to this session, uh, Mr. Gupta. This is uh, the Economic Times Microsoft Resilient Masterminds. You are joining us on the discussion around building strategic leadership for a hybrid future. Mr. Gupta, welcome. Thank you very much for finding time for us. Thank you for having me. So first, uh, Mr. Gupta, we'd just like to understand from you a little bit, you know, coming from your experience from uh, working with government in the areas of, you know, digital inclusion and so many other areas we heard, right? Smart cities, internet governance, data security, privacy. Tell us a little bit about your experience with uh, working with the government in these areas. How has the experience been and what are the trends you see going forward? What are the things that are going to happen now? I think um, uh, allocation and Suchetna, uh, I, I can tell you uh, very exciting things uh, that are happening. But the biggest, uh, the question that you really asked um, is the role of government. And you know, the Prime Minister says the government should not be in the business of being in business. And, ex and that is exactly what, at least in the digital world, the government is doing. It's acting as an enabler. And it is over the last seven years, I think this, uh, the transformation a very, very a bipartisan across India transformation that we have seen with the government being at the center of that transformation and really catapulting India into the fourth industrial revolution. Now, let me give you with some examples. India has is home to the only non-private platform in the world. You've seen all the platforms, the FANG platforms, uh, the FANG platforms from Silicon Valley, the BBAT platforms from from the, the Chinese uh, Silicon Valley in Shenzhen. We have, apart from these nine platforms, the 10th platform, which has a billion users, is actually a platform from India, which is an indigenously built platform called the India Stack or the Aadhaar Stack. The government just acted in a very, very new policy thinking of creating digital public platforms as public goods. So it's public infrastructure. And built on this infrastructure, you've had now numerous uh, innovations on top of it. The whole fintech revolution that you hear in India, the whole uh, DBT that the government uses, the whole UPI revolution, the payments revolution that you hear, it's all built on top of a public goods platform called India Stack. No other country has done this. And two things are very important in the approach that I have seen. The government is acting as an enabler soft regulator and three wherever they're trying to build they're building platforms of scale uh, you mentioned my role in the government my gov it's the world's biggest and you know with india everything has to be the biggest indigenously built citizen engagement platform more than 15 million users interact with the government get information about the government um, and it, it was highlighted at the, the largest scale possible was during the uh, during the pandemic that we are seeing the fag end of the pandemic with the uh, you know with the uh, the vaccine drive even starting. MyGov released the Arogya Setu um, has been a big partner with Arogya Setu. Arogya Setu is one of the big platforms which is partnered with Coven to deliver now the last mile vaccine uh, appointments and everything else. So I think the whole approach of the government to build platforms which are scalable, indigenous, open, and can operate with each other, starting from Aadhaar to UPI to EKYC to MyGov to Arogya Setu is, is the lesson that I think we, I have learned uh, from operating within the company, uh, within the government. And I think the government itself today is a biggest startup disruptor and an enabler, enabler at the same time. Right. You talk of startups and at the heart of it is innovation. So we've been reading up, uh, up about you and we uh, see that you're a strong believer of solve for India, sell to the world. So how do you see the position of India as an innovation hub of the world? Oh, that's a great question. See, um, uh, you mentioned I lived in Silicon Valley. I've said this many times. Silicon Valley innovates for the top billion of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the world has about 8 billion people. Give or take. Silicon Valley will always innovate top down. And you've seen that approach. I mean, if you, you e-commerce started as a top-down thing, uh, the expensive Apple phones are top-down approach. Nobody uh, at the bottom of the pyramid can afford that smartphone. But those are very valuable companies, great approach. India's approach is very different. And as you said, number one, its approach is 
bottom up take take solutions take produce platform which solve dif very difficult societal problems and if you can solve problems at the bottom of the pyramid of course it can reach the top and and everybody will be a user and that's exactly what india has done and that approach when it takes to the government government as a service or to startups who are using that innovation approach of bit sizing transactions making it very low value but volume is huge those those lessons which are you know and india presents the most diverse most difficult uh, landscape for any innovation we have literacy levels which are varied across the country we have languages which are 22 23 languages and and we have you know in cities 4g working very well and in the rural part of india 2g struggling so you know if you can work in those environments you can work anywhere in the world right and that is the lesson that is solving for india first and taking that learning and then selling to the world whether it's the government solutions or solutions by our startups and we are seeing that movement happening um, all across we are seeing some of the fintech startups going to developing countries solving their problems becoming part of those cultures those societies so uh, remember india's approach is different from the from a income pyramid perspective not top down but bottom up and that's that's what the next uh, 7 billion of the planet need they need problems which help them get better livelihood uh, better sustenance better education better skills uh, better identity right in fact what you say reminds me of uh, many years ago you know when reverse innovation became a buzzword in india and you will remember professor uh, you know uh, vijay govindraj and some of the other management gurus who, who always said that reverse innovation should be happening from developing economies like india where a lot of innovation happens and it can then be scaled up in, in other countries including in developed economies so that's a great uh, you know way to do it and i think the startups are really taking that reverse innovation uh, paradigm to a completely different kind of level and so uh, great to hear you on that meanwhile uh, let us take a look at a different slightly different aspect you know we have all been talking about ai ml iot and all these uh, you know new age uh, digital digital technologies and in the future we are going to see already you know there are signs of uh, quantum uh, you know science and there's mixed reality and so a lot of technology is going to influence our societies and our lives and businesses going forward right so how do you see this technologies really you know they are leveling the playing field for the populations across the world but from an organization perspective what would you say are some of the fundamentals for organizations to innovate on these technologies responsibly you know on the issues of ethics trust security what is it that they should be doing i think alokesh you asked a very very pertinent a very important question you know let's let's take uh, health for an example now health you you wear these watches which are also iot devices at the end of the day they right. have sensors they sense certain things uh, from your body and then you know probably store it on your phone hopefully just this phone and with your consent probably pass it on but now the whole issue of ethics and trust in technology will become very very important for for startups for innovators for large and small companies i think the biggest thing for the next and i can't predict 10 years i can probably go for 3 to 4 years is going to be trust and if you are giving that trust to the user that you are using their data with their consent or you are using the data ethically or you are if at all and you are not sharing it for the purpose of data harvesting or marketing i think the, and and the fact that you are doing what you are supposed to do and not going beyond your mandate uh, the trust factor in technology uh, the ethics factor in the usage of technology will become a very very uh, underlying thing for uh, for success in the future for success of any innovation in the future um yeah, yeah. and and i think that will apply to all technologies whether that's ai ml i mean you look at the issue of ethics in ai the black box that 99% or 99.9999% of humanity will not understand but if that is an ai engine that you are using to give credit to the masses but has a bias built inside it has a okay. certain exclusion criteria that you will never figure out but you are being told you know this this engine decided whether you will get a credit or not or this engine decided whether you get a loan or not and mm. you you finally if you test it and you find that trust is not there in that algorithm that will be bad for that organization that company or whoever else uses those algorithms so i think uh, the whole 
codification of trust and ethics in our processes and our technology uh, will be inherent. And that's my big advice to start. You know, along with the trust and security, the other aspect of technology is inclusivity. As someone you know who's seen digital inclusion take shape through the past decade for India, what do you have to say about technology and its role as a unifying factor, which will help India accelerate its growth trajectory? Again, that's a great, great point, because again, as I said, given the bottom up approach, technology has to play an inclusive role, not an exclusive role. And let's let's look at the current uh, situation of vaccination. Take, take uh, the enrollment that has just started what is called the phase three of the vaccination, where we are enrolling common citizens, uh, 60 plus senior citizens, 45 plus to 60 uh, as people with comorbidities. We also know that there is a digital divide in India. And that's that brings about this whole point of do we do we only have an approach which is only on the smartphone or on a platform or or no? I think technology, the platforms have to be very, very, you know, cognizant of the learning that comes from such uh, such big rollouts is that, for example, the Coven platform in India, you can access it through, you know, through uh, uh, through, the, of course, the digital means as uh, the portals and other apps like Aroge Setu, but you can also access it via call center. You can register and the right. same backend works. So that's what I call offline access. It can work through CSCs, so assisted access. And so the same system is working via many means. And that is, and that eventually those people will come online and, and you know their data will be there, it will be singly stored, and that's where the identity becomes a unique identifier, the Aadhaar platform. But the lesson is that you cannot make technology it's, you know, something that excludes a lot of majority of population. The, another great example in uh, in the Indian context is uh, UPI. I know many people right. sometimes think UPI is only through one of many of these wallets or payment gateways or banks. But do you all need to understand UPI is also used by people with non smartphones, people who have the the candy bar phone by using something called USSD, star 99 hash. And that's a great example of the same technology working on a non smartphone. And I give that example globally because we are very proud of that, that this is the way we tackle tough problems. And to all the audience, to all the uh, you know uh, participants in this conference, I will request you to just take a time out and press star 99 hash on your phones and see what happens. The same platform that you have seen as Beam or as uh, within an ICICI or SBI suddenly becomes alive on a non-smartphone. And, and that's the beauty of ex in inclusion in India. Our, uh, our approach is bottom up, making sure the offline inclusion also happens, making sure people with low literacy levels are included. And, um, and that's a great lesson when you ask solve for the world. That's a, another great lesson for innovators and startups. Can you s extend your platform by using other means to people who probably cannot you know, um, can can book a uh, book a cab, for example, with a smartphone, or their internet is down. Imagine if your internet is down, and uh, through to whatever reason, but you can still book a car, uh, or a cab, and the cab will show up. So that that's innovation. But that the the roots of those innovation come from uh, the question that you raised, Jaitna, is can we learn from how do you keep everybody included? That's fantastic. In fact, I'm going to try star 99 hash right after this meeting gets over. And uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Gupta, there were the days, older days of when we were talking about e-governance, right? And e-governance, uh, we used to, as journalists, we used to track how different states are doing on e-governance, right? There would be ratings and rankings on e-governance and things like that. But now that has moved into digital governance and uh, the scale like you rightly pointed out, you know, so many examples of how digital governance has really taken over uh, governance and has helped the government and citizens also in different ways in collaborating. Uh, if you could just outline to us in, in the evolution of this journey going forward, what are the challenges that are still there? There's obvious that, you know, we are leveraging technology not only through digital, but even through means by which we can use uh, non smartphones to get through get access and to deliver services. But what are the challenges that are still there? Some improvements that you feel should be looked at? What is the way forward? I think that's another very excellent point. The way forward for you, we call it Digital India 2.0. 
is again number one a lot of indigenously built platform a lot more dependence on our local the whole you know art and labor bharat concept let's build more more internally uh, data centers can we have a lot more data centers which are governed and managed in india um, the a combination of the hybrid cloud uh, which governments uh, state governments also need to adopt i mean today with the uh, with the with the advent of cloud and the adoption of cloud we know we can scale up very fast and that's another lesson that i think um, the government has learned very fast the whole coven platform is on a on a hybrid cloud so i think the uh, whole um, approach of how do you make that agile methodology come to the government roll out of platforms um needs to not only be central driven but also be driven by each state each you know i can go uh, to even deeper levels but let's let's have all the states uh, be equal participant in that i'm not saying they are not they they are uh, equal participants right now some vary as you say uh, you know there was a digital uh, e governance ranking same there is a disparity there is a digital governance disparity but we want to make sure that all states on the union territories of india are equal on that because this is digital governance is easy governance digital governance is a governance that includes everybody digital governance is transparent and that's something that the prime minister has led from the front that we need more transparent more more distributed governance which really disrupts uh, uh, the way the government operates as you mentioned that uh, you know india has uh, its unique problems and therefore india needs to innovate for itself so in 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 this scheme of things what do you think is the role of iot in buildings education healthcare utilities and even beyond that you know let me i can go on and on on uh, the the, uh, the use of iot in each of these verticals that you have mentioned but healthcare i mentioned at at the passing that you know you have all these smart devices coming up agriculture Our, our biggest problem, our, one of the mm-hmm. biggest things that we face with the stated goal of this uh, doubling the farmer's income is, is really using local information to give local advice to those farmers. With the soil health cards that we have right now, use of IoT is being done by a lot of uh, uh, innovators already. That needs to be expanded in agriculture. Uh, you talked about IoT and sensors and smart buildings. You know, we've set out this whole task of smart cities. how more can we make our cities more smarter by using more sensors traffic sensors pollution sensors um you know um, uh, other environmental sensors uh, people movement sensors so that you know this is where the design of new cities new buildings new sub cities mini cities have to be all uh, sensor driven today the sensors are limited to our phones and our watches and a little bit that we are seeing but this is this is exploding as we are talking globally and india is right. not far behind in numbers but we have to use it a lot more the big challenge is retrofitting uh, so you know greenfield projects are all having a lot of iot lot of sensors you see a new hotel you go to you see all the sensors on you know temperature sensors motion sensors but if you if you now come to the you know slightly uh, the older lot and that's where the retrofitting is required so that same logic applies to cities and sub cities and communities that we have to start using things uh, which help people in safety in um, in mobility and uh, in environmental concerns alerts uh, and the use of sensors is highly required a lot more required i foresee in the next 2 to 3 years that will really go up a lot thank you mr gupta for uh, those answers great listening to you and we could go on for the next 10 minutes actually just listening to you speak about all the changes that india has been going through and as you've pointed out that you know india's uniqueness lies in its population the age of the population and its people which many could see as a disadvantage but taking it as an opportunity we need to innovate for ourselves and then perhaps sell to the world as you said solve for india sell to the world thank you so much uh, mr gupta for sparing the time for taking the time out and uh, speaking to us thank you very much thank you thank you thank you mr gupta okay, thank you Thank you.